God bless you. I want to thank you for joining me again for another time of word, inspiration, and enrichment. And I tell you, it's been a marvelous privilege to grow in this process of sharing God's word on a regular basis and be able to have it available to those who want to have breathed into them and built up in them the word of truth as it pertains to how we live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I want to share with you today from the subject, which you may have already seen if you looked at the title of this video and the message, and that is why Jesus came. Now, there's another part to that. I didn't want to make the, the title too long. Uh, why Jesus came and why I'm here. And that needs to be more personal to you. It, it should be you looking at it from the perspective of why Jesus came and why you're here. Not I'm here, you're here. But when you say it, you should say why Jesus came and why I'm here. All right? Okay. So let us pray for our time together and then we'll jump into this magnificent, magnificent word. All right. Our Father, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity to share your word that it might be heard to those around the world for there to be growth and development and blessing and peace and inspiration and enrichment, that there might be breathing into and betterment of their lives. Father, we ask that you would keep us, establish us, Make known the magnificence of your truth to us and cause us to live within the beauty and blessing of all that is good. Bless our hearing today. Bless our receiving. Bless our believing. Bless our doing. Bless our delivering to the praise of your glory and to the benefit that comes with it for us. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. I won't be before you long. I just want to briefly share with you a message of encouragement and edification. And that is, again, why Jesus came. Okay, let's go over to Romans, the 8th chapter. Before I share from Romans, the 8th chapter, I want to give you a brief perspective of what the Apostle Paul was sharing in the seventh chapter. In the seventh chapter, he talked about the reality of the law not being our taskmaster, overseer, the one to whom we answer, and the one to whom is the standard we must, we must meet, okay? But before we even really deal with this reality of the law, we've got to go back and consider something, something you probably already know about, and that is the beginning. We must give consideration to the fact that God, in the beginning, in time, he established time. Um, in that time he established, he created heavens space and he created earth matter and even in the context of that he established other aspects like that's the platform of this environment he then established the parameters of our being our doing and our having he said to after he created man male and female created them according to his image after his likeness in such a manner that when he blessed them he said to them be fruitful, be, multiply, replenish, and subdue. Well, all of that is in the context of doing because you can't be multiply. You can't be <laughs> replenish. You, you must do replenish, do multiply, do replenish, do subdue. Then he says, have dominion, have dominion in, in the earth in the manner that God has dominion in the universe. 
<laughs> but he gives specifics. He never says have dominion over other people. He says have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the creatures, the beast of the field, the the fish of the, I did say the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. Okay, all, all the things that were subordinate creation, even over creation itself with regard to the elements of this environment as it pertains to our ability to subdue. Now, man was given a command to eat of every, fr every fruit of the trees of the garden freely. Every fruit of the trees of the garden freely except one. He was given an absolute experience of abundance by God. But if he was to choose contrary to the command of God and decide to take of the tree which God said not to, which was said not to and commanded not to because of benefit, huh? then he would find himself experiencing lack, not abundance. And we find because of the reality of the text that tells us that there was a decision and a choice related to, watch this, eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because they were given a deceptive perspective to believe that they would become as gods, knowing good and evil, meaning that they themselves will be able to be God and determine what is right and wrong, which was not true because it was spoken by a deceiver who Jesus said was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So as a result, God, following these circumstances, gave the law to the people of Israel, who we know to be the Jews or the Hebrews. He did not give the law as a means of being salvation for them. While many people believe such, he only gave it in order that it might be an illustration of God's righteous expectations and man's inability to meet them in sinful nature. With that said, we find ourselves coming back to our text today. I'm giving you a very brief perspective here where we here, the Apostle Paul talking about we no longer have to submit to that law, not that the law is of no value, for he says that. He more so says this law is not the standard which we should meet, but it is a vehicle through which we should move or make use of the standard we are to meet. Now, the standard, though, is our faith in Christ. He's going to tell us why here in just a moment. The standard is not the law, but the pleasure of God. And the pleasure of God is something that we should seek. Now, this comes to where we're going to get into our message today. And that is this. The subject is why Jesus came and why I'm here. <laughs> Paul tells us that he has this issue, this chaotic reality, or as he says, wretched reality that we all exhibit or experience. And that is the desire to do what is right, but the inability to decide to do what's right. Because there's a law at work in us, the law of sin and death, that inhibits us, that restricts us from actually doing what is good. So he declares that I am a wretched man, actually not so just a wretched man. He is such a man that it is a disturbing reality that he cannot, that we cannot believe what is true and good. So I'm going to start in the seventh and read into the eighth. Let's go together. I'll start at seven and twenty one and then we'll read into eight for a few verses there. We've read from this passage before, if you follow me, but this is another perspective I want to give you today. 7 and 21, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I delight in the law of God in my inner being, 
that's in my subconscious, in the very substance of my heart. But in, but I see in my members, my flesh, my body, my passions, my desires, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Huh. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There's therefore now, this is eight now, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Watch this, y'all. By sending his own son in the likeness of of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. He goes on and tells us some things about those who walk according to the flesh. They experience the consequence of that. And those who walk according to the spirit experience the consequence of that as well. But we're not going to get into that today. I want to focus on what you just heard. For God, this is verse 3 of 8, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. In other words, the law was not able to be a means of salvation because the flesh was weak as it pertained to the law. When the flesh, Paul says this in the seventh chapter, actually, when the flesh or when the, the, the body gives, uh, gets recognition of what God's law says, the body just says, you know what? I don't care. Matter of fact, it not only says I don't care, it says, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do exactly what it said not to do because I feel that that is pleasing to me. I want the pleasure of that, regardless of the outcome or the consequence. I want that. Not so, said the cat. That ain't going to make it right. So the flesh has no ability to do what is good of its own because the flesh seeks to be satisfied. The mind seeks to be clarified. The mind seeks what is true, what is good. And so if you have the presence of the truth in your mind, the mind says, hey, I want to do what's good. So if you know the law of God, you should want to do it. But Paul said, if I know the law of God, but then my flesh, what, what's the thing? Well, if the flesh is more powerful, if the desires and passions of our bodies are more powerful, guess what? We're in trouble. But somebody had to destroy that power and give us the ability to walk overcoming it. Who was that? Hmm. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. He gave us not just somewhere. I'm going to come back to that. He gave us in the flesh the ability to have in our minds, specifically deep down in our hearts, in our subconscious. He gave us the ability to have that information, perspective, truth, and righteous regard and requirement in us and then walk consistent with it. See, prior to Christ, there was no ability to overcome the will of the flesh. Because there was no presence of the spirit. That's another conversation. But here's what I want you to have. The main reason that I brought this up is because I want you to know Jesus did not come here for us to go to heaven. <laughs> might we attain heaven? We might. We may, if you will, as we believe. For he even said on the cross when he spoke to the thief who believed on him, he said to the thief that today you will be with me in paradise. Hmm. Okay. 
So, so we can actually be present with the Lord. Even the, the scripture says, blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from his four gates of the spirit. They shall rest from their labors. Okay, that's good. But when we rest from our labors, guess where we find ourselves? We are absent from the body, but we are present with the Lord. Where is it that Jesus is? It says that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly place. Now, let me, let me make sure you understand real quickly where I'm coming from. Too often we come to faith in Christ because we want to go to heaven and we don't want to go to hell. Let me just tell you, that's not a bad desire. But you must understand that we are not in this earth believing on Jesus and believing on him with great fervor and commitment so that we go to heaven alone. You know why? Because listen to what the writer told us. He said this about why Jesus came. He said, let me get back to it because I was going to another passage. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This right here was specifically about reconciling us, returning us, refreshing us in what God intended in the very beginning was for us to have fellowship with him and for us to be a representation of all of the beauty and glory of his righteousness here. So that the manner in which we live, which walk according to. So what do we walk according to? In other, in other words, what do we live by? That's what walk according to can be said as we live by what? Not our own passions, not our own satisfactions, but we live by righteousness. The example established by God, the experience established by God and the reality of empowered living is that what did Jesus come here for and why am I here? Jesus came here to re-empower me for the life that I'm really supposed to live. And I'm here because there's a life that God established me to live for the purpose of enriching this environment, loving him, loving the people, serving them, and doing so within the context of all the value of ability that he gave me to make this place a wonderful place. That's why you're here. Jesus came to make this place wonderful for us. But listen, if the highest form of creation is human nature and human nature had malfunction, guess what? If it was about heaven, Jesus would have stayed in heaven and done what he needed to do there. But it wasn't about heaven. It was about earth. It was not just about earth. It was about what was having an issue in us. We will malfunction and he came so we can function appropriately. You hear me now? Okay, let me get off of that. The point that I want you to understand is Jesus came here for you and me. That's what John tells us in his third chapter of his gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not continue in a perishing way of living. But now... Walk in life. Have the life of God at work in them so that they can experience magnificence beyond their perception, beyond what they had ever experienced before. Now they live consistent with the mind of the one who created them to live. All right, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Listen, Jesus came in the flesh to condemn sin in the flesh so that what God actually established or the reason that God gave law could be something that we could pursue and it would no longer be something that was always burdening us. He came so that we could actually live our lives the way they were intended to be lived. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you. Give us to hold this word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Establish us, keep us in the very beauty of it. To the praise of your glory and to the benefit that comes with it, we pray in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Hey, listen to me, listen to me well. Jesus came for a magnificent reason and he shows it. Go read Philippians, the second chapter, and you will see even why it was such a wonderful reality of what he did. Because here's the truth. Now, while you're here, for the time that you have, you're able to live with great intentionality, ingenuity, and opportunity to experience all the beauty of life that God has purposed for you. You go be blessed to be a blessing.